God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. That's the way to always prepare our hearts to remember that he is good. And he is not good <coughs> sometimes. He is good all the time. As I mentioned, my name is James. I'm the pastor here. And as I mentioned earlier, my wife, Allison, Braden, and Joshua, we're also glad to have you all here. And I uh, appreciate y'all lifting little Joshua up in prayer. Um, we're very grateful for that. Uh, for those that are here in person, you have the ability to uh, let us know that you're here as a guest. And so you can fill out a blue card. If I did not get one to you already, you can do that and put a name and a phone number. If you want to put any more information, you're more than welcome. And I'll be following up with you today or tomorrow, uh, depending on what's going on at the home, to be honest with you. Um, but I also remind you on the back of that blue card, there's a decision card because many of you have made decisions to get baptized, become uh, Christians become members and other things by filling it out and letting me know that you wanted to talk to me about those things. And so you can do that as well. And then what you'll do is you'll put it in the offering plate on your way out. For those of you online, there are two links. There's a guest link and a decision link, and that gives you the ability to be able to do the same, to be able to let us know that you worship with us as a guest, but also to let us know that the Lord is working on you with some things and you'd like to talk to a pastor. So we'd love to be able to help you with that. Uh, let's move on to the message. So, we've made it. Say made it. Made it. We've made it. We've made it to John chapter 21. John chapter 1 verse 1. All the way to John chapter 21 verse 25. We've made it. We've survived. And I don't know about you, but I feel better if we're going through the gospel of John. I appreciate my Savior more. I appreciate the disciples more. And I'll tell you what. The Lord convicted. He sanctified. And he worked on a lot of you as well as working on myself, and I'm grateful for it. Next week, I know so many of you can't wait. If the Lord wills it, we will begin our very first verse-by-verse -verse series through the ever-exciting book of Revelation. The last book of the Bible that nobody cares about, nobody talks about, nobody posts YouTube videos about, and so, you know, nobody cares about the book of Revelation, right? <laughs> there are thousands and thousands of books written about the book of Revelation, and we're not going to talk about those books. We're going to talk about the book that God has given us, and I look forward to talking through that with you next Sunday. So, if you want to come prepared, read Revelation chapter 1 throughout the week, once or more than once, so that your heart will be ready to receive what the Word says. My question that I want to ask you today is very simple. Are you willing to suffer as you live out your faith in Jesus Christ? I know that's not the question that many of you anticipated being asked when you first surrendered your life to Christ. It wasn't the question that I anticipated asking either. I wasn't anticipating being asked that. The truth is that when I gave my life to Christ, that I was thinking about who? Me. But as I read my Bible, <laughs> it's not about me. It's not about you. It's always been about Jesus. Amen. Now I know that we have this United States of America mentality because we live in a free land where we can say the name of Jesus without fear. Where we can post about him. Where we can share him. And where we can preach from streets. But if you do those things in other countries, if you own a Bible, in other countries, your life is at risk. I ask you again, are you willing to suffer as you live out your faith in Jesus Christ? Because there are people that will surrender their lives to Jesus today in other countries, knowing that they have signed their death warrant and that they will be captured and tortured and probably executed because of doing so with less than 30 days. Are we willing to live our lives willing to suffer for our faith in Jesus Christ? <clears throat> this week, I want you all to repeat after me by saying the following. Jesus, Jesus. deserves my everything. Deserves my I was going to see if you were going to say all of everything. <laughs> Got to have some fun in church, amen? Got to. Got to. Before we dive into God's word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're about to open up your word. Lord, as we open it, 
Lord, let us retain what it says. Let us understand why it says it. Let us obey what it teaches us to obey. Lord, let us be bold and pray for the opportunities and take advantage of the opportunities to share it with others. And let us do all of that for your glory and not for our own. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. 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 Better tell you all about the time, four times where uh, we're praying in our family worship time. And I'll end it sometimes. Everyone said, and look at me, we're not in church, Daddy. I'm like, yeah, I'm not used to it. It's a habit. <laughs> so today, again, we're going to begin in John 21, beginning in verse 1. So feel free to follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. A reminder to do sermon listening guides in the back if you would like one. Uh, so before we dive into this chapter, let me give you a little bit of a recap. John 18. Jesus goes through many rushed, unfair trials. Rushed and unfair. Then after that, uh, John 19, he never actually is declared guilty officially. It's just he says, okay, then. And, and what happens is he's beaten and he's nailed to a cross. And he breathes his last. And he does it because he loves you. And he wanted to give you a bridge, a door, a way to enter into a right relationship with the Father. John 20. Jesus reveals himself to have been resurrected, and he reveals himself on multiple occasions to his students, or uh, what we refer to as his disciples. Which brings us to John 21, beginning in verse 1. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, which is another name for the Sea of Tiberias. And this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples. So, uh, this appearing is worded in the Greek as manifested. Say manifested. manifested. You and I most likely had never manifested before. Manifested is a word that is used as a miraculous appearing. He's there. All right? Now, I know that we as parents sometimes make our children think that we manifest, but Jesus really did manifest, and he appeared. And, and it's so interesting that he appears on the scene right when he needed to, and we're about to see why that is. But notice one thing, just to help you understand some things. I think some things are cool to share, that Peter is named first in all the list of the disciples. Why is that? It, it, some people will say it's because of his age. Possibly, but most likely it's because of the general leadership of the group. Peter is, as Jesus said, to be the head of the church. He's to be the rock. He's to be the one that goes and proclaims the gospel. Now, is he the only one? No. But in the group of disciples, he is the one they look to. Hopefully, not when he's putting his foot in his mouth. Verse 3. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Well, come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Now, real quick, just in case you didn't know, these are experienced, gruff fishermen. These are not newbies. These are not people that don't know what they're doing. These are people who know very well what they're doing. And some pastors and some Christians have said that Peter and the other disciples were going back to what they knew since Jesus was not constantly with them. I'm not so sure of this claim. Uh, here's why. These are the same disciples who have just witnessed a resurrected Jesus in John chapter 20. Thomas literally put his hand through the wounds of Christ. I don't think that they were being disobedient, being out there. Personally, what I believe is that because in Matthew 28 and Mark chapter 14 and Mark chapter 16, we have evidence that Jesus said, Go and wait for me in Galilee. And so where are they? Galilee. And they're waiting. And while they're waiting, they say, hey, let's go fishing. All right? And that's what I believe. I don't think we need to always throw the disciples under the bus because we read something into it. Let's take the whole Bible and let's let it be its commentary on itself. Now, the disciples would fish on a boat like you see in the picture on the screen. That would have been the kind of boat. And so it wasn't big, but it wasn't small either. 
As a matter of fact, um, the, the size of the boat would have been the size of like a delivery truck. And I know none of you have used Amazon at all during the last two years. And so you don't know what a delivery truck looks like. But just go outside and when you're driving, you'll see one. And that was the size, the length of the boat. Now, the width wasn't as big as a delivery truck. And so they have this boat and they're experienced fishermen and they go out there and they go to fish with what? Poles or nets? Nets. And so here's a picture of what the net would have looked like. All right, and so they would toss the net and if it's two boats, then it's done a little bit differently. But when it's one boat, it's done this way. They would toss the net, it would have weights all around it, it would sink into the water and it would, like, it would close in on one another and it would gather whatever is within the net. And they had a rope and they would pull the net up. And so what you need to know is that when disciples would fish, that they did so oftentimes at night. And you say, why is that? Because it was hot. <laughs> All right. But also that when morning came and they had their catch, they would have their catch ready for the market. So that they would be able to bring it to the market and it's nice and fresh. And so it's dark, they're out there, they're doing it all night long, but they catch nothing at all. How many of you have ever gone fishing and caught nothing? Did you enjoy it? They didn't either. And so what we need to know is that they're out there and they're fishing. They're doing what they know how to do. And it's just not happening. Verse 4, at dawn, so what's happened is, is now we've made it around 6 a.m. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the di disciples, the diapers, the disciples could not see who he was. He called out, fellows, children, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. And so Jesus is about 100 yards away from, uh, he's on shore about 100 yards from them. It's dark. They're tired. They, I don't know about you, but 100 yards is kind of far from me. And so they, they hear this man. He calls out, and they don't necessarily recognize that it's Jesus. Now, it could have been that Jesus just said, no, I'm not going to let you know that it's me. But I want you to know Jesus' humor. Jesus wasn't asking the question. He was declaring, I see you've caught no fish. Don't you love it when that happens? Verse 6. Then he being Jesus said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did. And they could not haul in the net, because there were so many, what was it? Fish. Fish. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, we know that to be John, who is the author of this book, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. Yep, he was probably naked. At the very least, he had a loincloth on jumped into the water, and he headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat, and they pulled, literally dragged the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Now, some commentators have suggested that fishermen normally cast nets from the left side of the boat because the steering oar was on the right side. I can't say that that's for certain, but that would make a little bit of sense since both times Jesus told them to cast the net on the right side of the boat. It doesn't make sense, but they did it, and they received the blessing of it. I also find it interesting how quickly John recognizes Jesus. Now, as I pointed out to you, uh, I believe, from my reading of the text, that there is a strong possibility that John is the cousin of Jesus that his mother's name was Salome, and that his mother was the sister of Mary. And so we have John, he <coughs> knows Jesus intimately. This is the same John who Jesus let know that Judas was gonna betray by a whisper without letting the other disciples know. John has this connection with Jesus. And as soon as it happens, it's the Lord! And he's excited. And so what happens is, is Peter does what Peter does. <laughs> Bye! And so what does he do? He never really thinks. He just reacts. That's who Peter is. And so he's like, I'm naked. I'm not going to go hug Jesus naked. So i got to throw my clothes on, and I'm going to jump in the water, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to see Jesus. What was the last thing outside of seeing the resurrected Jesus that Peter remembers and that has been haunting him? 
the betrayal, the denial. Once, twice, or three times. And so we see this going on. Peter, you know, whoo, <laughs> he's excited. But don't miss the significance of the charcoal fire. You see, the Greek word for charcoal fire is only used twice in John's Gospel. It's used here, and it's used in John 18.18. 18. And in John 18.18 18 is the scene where Peter denied Jesus. It wasn't a common way of fire. I imagine it didn't escape Peter's notice. I'm certain that Jesus made this type of fire for a reason. I'm certain that Peter would never forget this moment in his life. See, the interesting thing is, is that Jesus doesn't leave us believers in Christ alone. He confronts us. And I'm so glad that he does. But when he confronts us, it's never to hurt us, it's to restore us. But it all depends on how we what? How we respond to his confronting. Now, where did the food come from? I don't know. Remember, he manifested, so maybe he manifested it with him. All right? We got Star Trek happening here. I don't know. Maybe he just said, let there be. And there was. But he provided the need that the disciples could not provide on their own. Verse 6. Oh, I apologize. Verse 10. Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard, and he dragged the net to the shore, and there were 153 large fish, and yet the net had not formed. So the nets that these fishermen used should not have been capable of holding on to such a large amount of large fish. It should not have happened. It should have torn. So this is another miracle performed by Jesus. And notice all of these men together could not get the full of the fish to shore. They couldn't do it. But Peter... He's like, <laughs> he goes over there, who, who, who? Y'all know those guys. You shake their hand and your hand disappears. And so he grabs the net and he probably doesn't even struggle with it. And he brings it to shore. But why the 153? How many of you have ever heard someone try to explain the 153? I don't care. And there are a lot of crazy explanations out there. There are a lot of thoughts out there. Here's why I think it says 153. Because John was a fisherman, and what do fishermen do when they finish fishing? They count their fish, especially when they're used to bringing the fish to the marketplace. But also, why would the Holy Spirit include this? Further evidence that John was truly a witness to all of this. None of this was done by accident. Verse 12. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus <laughs> served them the bread and the fish. And this is the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. The disciples knew whose presence they were in. When you open up God's word, do you know what is before you? I, I, I've been discipling some of you and some outside of our church, one-on-one uh, -on -one and, 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 and doing couples. And, and one thing I've been trying to reiterate is the importance that when you open up the scripture before you read a word, say a prayer. Now, specifically, the prayer that I say is the prayer that we end our service with. It's the prayer that I begin our sermons with, that we need to ask the Lord to help us retain what is there, to understand why it is there, to see what he would have us obey, and to give us opportunities to share it with believers and non-believers, all for his glory. And so what it does is, is it reminds us we don't hold a book in our hands. We hold the very words of God. Amen? Amen. They knew whose presence they were in. Think how often we see Jesus serving others, specifically his disciples. Jesus served the meal. I assure you that he broke the bread. I assure you it brought them back to the Lord's Supper and the many other meals that they had experienced. And I guarantee you that he gave thanks to his Heavenly Father. 
Now, this isn't the third time that Jesus appeared in total to the disciples. It's just the third time in the Gospel of John that Jesus has appeared to the disciples. Just to clarify, there are some people that will say that makes it an error. No, it's just the Gospel of John is its own book. Verse 50. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, I imagine it wasn't like this. I imagine it was actually like this. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Peter would love you. You know I love you. <coughs> then feed my lambs, Jesus said. What is these? Uh, there are two uh, thoughts to this. I lean on this other thought, but here are the two thoughts. The first is, is that the these is the fish. Do you love me more than this life that you had before me? It's a possibility. I lean the other way. Do you love me more than these disciples love me? And the reason I lean that way, if you don't recall, there was a time where Jesus was talking and where Peter spoke up and said, I would be willing to die for you even if everyone else abandoned you. Really, Peter, do you love me more than these? There's so much that Jesus is teaching Peter in this scenario. The word for love that Jesus used was a sacrificial love. The word that uh, Peter used was not. It was a brotherly kind of love. He, he was, in essence, saying, you know I'm fond of you, Jesus. But was that what Jesus was asking? No. See, the sacrificial kind of love, Peter couldn't say anymore because he just denied him three times. Verse 16. Jesus repeated the question. Oh, I apologize. I want to hit that. Then feed my lambs. Or in other words, lead and care for the people I entrust you. Verse 16. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. I know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Then shepherd my sheep, Jesus said. So Jesus, once again, speaks of this sacrificial love, and Peter uses the brotherly love. And once again, Jesus tells Peter to care for the shepherd, the people that he entrusted. Verse 17, a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. He was grieved that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. This time Jesus uses the same word that Peter had been using. The brotherly love. And I know that some people will say that it was to hurt Peter, but Jesus doesn't come to hurt. He comes to restore, to convict. And so when I read this, what I see is that he had to get Peter to humble himself. And he's going to continue this throughout this chapter. He had to get Peter to stop looking at everybody else and trying to be better than them. And what he's doing is he's restoring Peter to the membership, to the fellowship. He's restoring Peter to the mission. Because if Peter doesn't have this conversation with Jesus, I don't think Peter comes on the scene in the book of Acts. Peter needed this. How many of you currently are going through some struggles in life? Raise your hand. Are you bringing them to Jesus? Because I remind you, Jesus does not come to bring you down. He comes to restore you, to embrace you, to give you exactly what you need. All we have to do is humble ourselves and to come to Jesus and say, Here I am, Lord. I do love what Tony Evans said. Tony Evans said, sometimes God lets his people fail in order to develop them spiritually and prepare them for greater usefulness. 
John MacArthur said this about the word feed that you see in Scripture. The word feed conveys the idea of being devoted to the Lord's service as an under-shepherd who cares for his flock. The word has the idea of constantly feeding and nourishing the sheep. See, this served as a reminder that the primary duty of a messenger of Jesus Christ is to teach the word of God. Did you know that you all are messengers of Christ? We are all called to share God's word. Now, I find the best way to share God's word with unbelievers is by service. We actually talked about this in Sunday school. How can we say that we love Jesus if we won't love the people that Jesus loves? When you see someone in need, provide that need. And when you provide that need, by the provision of the Lord, you're not missing out. You're, you're using what God has given you. Amen? Provide the greatest need. The gospel. The truth. God's word. Amen? Verse 18. I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you. <coughs> and take you where you do not want to go. Some of you may read that and say, man, that's the truth. But that's not what it's saying. <laughs> Verse 19, Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus told him, follow me. I'm restoring you, and I'm assuring you that this is going to happen to you. Follow me anyway. Are you willing to follow Jesus anyway? Are you willing to use your business, to use your job for his glory and his gain and not your own? Are you willing to go to school and be the student, to be the child, that stands apart from all the other children, all the other students, by living according to God's word? Are you willing to be the senior adult who goes into the senior citizen's uh, facility, and you go there, and you display Christ? Are you willing to love those who are the unlovable, the ostracized, are you willing to love those that no one else loves? Are you willing to love those who hate you? Who hurt you? Who will hurt you? Follow me. Now, when Jesus said that you will stretch out your hand, that was a reference <laughs> to the cross. Every Jew and Gentile knew what those words meant. He was telling him that he would be crucified. See, church history tells us that around 30 years after this conversation between Jesus and AD 64, 68, many years before John wrote the Gospel of John, that Peter was crucified. He was crucified upside down. And he was crucified upside down because he did not believe himself worthy to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. He endured to the end. Matthew 16, 24 through 26, if you want to write that in your notes, says the following. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Here's what I have to say to you. The majority of the problems that you are experiencing in life probably is because of your disobedience. And you say, how can you say that? Because that's my life. 
that when I hand things over to God that I've been holding on to, it's like a breath that just comes inside of me. It's a weight that falls off of me. The marriages that you're trying to hold on to instead of just surrender to the Lord, that you're, you're, you barely know each other, that's not what the Word of God says marriage is to be. Your children, your children, they don't need to know how to be a good ball player alone. They don't need to know how to be a good this alone. They, they don't need to have these things consume their lives. Jesus should consume their lives. And that as they play ball, that they're playing it on mission for Jesus Christ. As they go to those things where they have to travel, as they go to those ballparks in our community, that they're not thinking, I can't wait to be the best baseball player. I can't wait to be the best football player. I can't wait to be the best cheerleader. I can't wait to be the best this. That I just can't wait to see the next opportunity that I get to display the glory of God through this that God has allowed me to be a part of. Amen. That when we go to work, it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. I know some of you, you're shaking your heads and you're nodding me when I tell you. And you're like, oh, you're right. You're probably No, I have given my back over to the Lord. I will accept whatever he gives me because it's not my back. It's his back because my body belongs to him. Because when I gave my life to Christ, I went all in. And there are times where this stupid individual will take things that belong to the Lord or that don't belong in this body, and I'll hold on to them. And it brings this weight, this shame, this distance from me and God. And when I do what Jesus says to do, to loose it, to free it, to give it away to the Lord, then I experience peace and joy that can only be found and it requires us to belong to Christ to free ourselves of the things of this world. It's not about having the best car. It's not about having the best house. It's not about being the best. It's about making sure that everyone knows that Jesus is the best. Verse 20. <laughs> I love the Bible. It's so funny. Say funny. You'll see why it's funny. Verse 20. Peter turned around and he saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. The one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? And Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? <laughs> ah! Anybody remember what John did when we were reading about the resurrection. What did he do? He made sure to include, oh, by the way, I beat Peter in the race. Right. <laughs> I beat him to the tomb. See, John and Peter, they go, it's so funny. And why would you put this unless it was true? Right? What does Jesus have to say? <laughs> Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive, until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that this disciple would not die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? What Jesus will teach us in this moment is very powerful. And it's something I continue to aim to teach my children almost every day. Focus on you and stop trying to compare yourself to your brother. So what am I telling you? Focus on you and stop trying to compare yourself to your brother and sister in Christ. You don't need to be like that YouTuber. No. You don't need to be like that person on TV. You don't need to be like that woman that you envy. You don't need to be like that man that you envy. Your marriage does not need to look like their marriage. Your marriage needs to look like what God's Word says marriage should look like. Amen? Your business does not need to be like those businesses. Your business needs to look like what God says your business should be based on. 
and let God let it look like how it will look because you built the foundation on him. See, the enemy, and I shared this in Sunday school, and I didn't plan on it, but I'm going to share it with you guys. The enemy works in two very distinct ways in scripture and in life. The first is, when it comes to believers in Christ, um, let's not let them do anything for the Lord. And so they try to give us excuses, uh, you know, go out of town for vacation, do this, do that. Oh, you got this money. Oh, you got this debt. Oh, you don't have gas. Oh, you're, you, you got family coming in. Bring the church. Just saying, oh, you got this. Oh, you got that. You, and the enemy is going to give you excuse after excuse after excuse. And, and, and his objective is, is to, to, for you not to do what the Bible says. Okay? And, and even he'll let you go as far as to plan. Say plan. plan. He'll let you plan. He'll say, you know, we'll go to church this week. And you have, an endor- you have this thing that happens in your brain where it will spike and it will tell you that you just did something good and you did nothing at all. <laughs> all right? Because then when you get to that, you're like, oh, we'll go to church next week. And that's where the enemy wants you to be. And, and I'm not attacking any of you specifically. I'm just saying that's how the enemy works. But then, say then, but when you actually start stepping up and then you start doing those things, you go to church, you, you break that, that barrier, you, you start reading your Bible, you start praying with your spouse, you start praying over your children, you start raising your children up in the Word, you start praying over your house. When you start doing the things that God's Word says to do, the enemy changes straight. And what he does is he changes from don't do this to be perfect in this. And if you're not perfect in this, then God doesn't want anything to do with you. You're not worthy. You should be ashamed of yourself. That is how the enemy works. And why am I telling you this? Because if you just take these two truths and you hold them tightly, then when the enemy attacks, you'll recognize his stupidity. You'll say, nah, I've seen you act in scripture and I've seen you act in my life. I will walk the straight road and I will keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> God wants you to walk with him. Church history tells us that the Apostle John was the only apostle to not be killed for his faith. Now you may say, wow, that's cool. Uh, Yeah, but he was sentenced to live on an island called Patmos by Rome's emperor Domitian. But it was only after (laughs) he was plunged into boiling oil by order of the emperor, only to not suffer from it in any way. I don't know why God protected John in that area and not protecting the people that are dying in the name of Jesus Christ then. I don't. And here's the thing that you and I have to do. It's called release. Say release. 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 We need to release this idea from hell that God owes us an explanation. He is God and we are not. I don't know why God gave me a sister who has never had the ability to see, who has been near death more times than I can count. I don't know why God gave me a sister who, up to this point, has never had the privilege, the joy, the opportunity to make Jesus her Lord and Savior. I know that I will see her again because she did not have that opportunity. But I don't know why God gave me that sister and yet didn't do that for someone else. I don't know why some children survive birth and some don't. But what we have to understand is, first off, God never wanted any of this to happen. That's why he created a perfect garden, a perfect world. But he loved us enough to choose him or to to rebel against him, to disobey him. And we chose the latter. And in doing so, we missed this world. But what I can tell you is, is I trust my Bible. And I trust that God is righteous. I trust that God is just. I trust that God is perfect. And that is enough for me. Are there times where I'm like David in the Psalms where I'm talking to him and saying, Lord, help me see this. Yes. But by the end of that prayer, I I feel the Lord saying, I 
I've never left you. I haven't left this situation. I care about the situation too. And reminding me of his truth. It's very simple. We are to follow him, period. To the end. Verse 24 and 25. The disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. So, verses 23 through 25. This is not like some, oh my goodness, like some people who attack the Bible will say that it is. Most likely, and I agree with this, verses 23, 24, and 25 were not written by John. Uh, most likely, um, it was after John's death, and what had happened was, is he wrote the Gospel of John, and it ended at verse 22, and people started thinking that John was going to live forever. And so, they included this. That's why you see this disciple is the one who testifies to these events. But what you will see is that in all of the early scripts that were passed down through all the churches, that this is included. And so what does that tell us? The Lord allowed it to be there for a reason. And what it teaches us is that you don't have to be John to obey the Lord. That this person, nobody will ever know their name. And nobody need to. Because the only name that we should focus on is Jesus. Jesus. Now, what we see is, is that through the Holy Spirit, John has given us a highlight reel of what he had witnessed. But as he also told us earlier in John 20, that this wasn't everything. It couldn't have been everything. The whole world could not hold all that Jesus had done. But that what is in the Gospel of John, which is why so many people love to suggest people to read it as new believers, or even as people searching to understand faith in Christ, that the whole Gospel of John is everything you need to know Christ and to, to serve him faithfully. Just like every other book that God put in the Bible. Because God can use his living word to bring life that once was dead. Amen? So hopefully after journeying with me through the entire Gospel of John, you see why so many people love this book. And hopefully you yourself have discovered more about Christ and more about your faith in this process. But again, at the beginning of this message, I asked you this question. Are you willing to suffer as you live out your faith in Jesus Christ? What is your answer to this question? I'll tell you that this is a question that you have to answer every day. Because it will require you to let go of the world more and more every day. John 3.30. He must increase. But I must decrease. Very good. So those of you Christians, you've witnessed the growth in your life. You know that you belong to Christ. You're still growing in Christ. What more do you need to surrender to Jesus in order to grow closer to Jesus Christ? For those of you who say that you're Christians, and yet there's been very little fruit or no fruit at all for a very long time, and honestly, you just said it because you want to go to heaven, or you just said it because you said a prayer, I ask you this question. Does the Bible and does the Holy Spirit confirm that you know him right now? Because if that is your life, you need to really evaluate whether you belong to Christ or not. To those of you who are not Christians, and you've made that choice yourself, as I've made so many times, then I would ask you three questions. One, is the reason that you're not a Christian, the reason you haven't given your life to Christ yet, because you've seen so many Christians in your life behave like hypocrites. I understand. I look in the mirror, and I'm like, dude, you've let me down. And I'm sure you've done the same. And if you put your faith in a Christian, they'll let you down. However, Jesus will not let you down. Have you said no to Jesus? Because God and his word go against how you want to live your life. I can't help you there. The only thing I can tell you is, is that you can't come to Christ until you have freely surrendered it all to him. And not necessarily saying you've done it all, 
but you've been willing. You started it. You said, all right, I'm moving in. I'm moving out of this world, and I'm moving into Christ. Jesus died for my sins. He paid the price. He's alive, and he wants me. And the only way I can get him is if I let go of this world, and I let his blood wash me clean. Make me new. And you can't do that if you're saying, I won't submit to this. Mark 1.15 says, The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Right now I tell you that don't know Christ, whether you're here or whether you're on video, the kingdom of God is near. And if you will repent of your sins, and if you will believe, if you will submit your life to Christ, make Jesus your Lord and Savior, you will receive the good news. You will receive salvation. Romans 10, 9 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Lord wants you to be assured in your salvation. And the best way to be assured of your salvation is to walk the straight path, to follow him, no matter what it costs you. Amen? Amen. It's time for me to say goodbye to those of you online. Um, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to help you know more about that. If you want to be, uh, want to ask questions about the church, or if you just have other things you want to talk about, feel free to call me or message me. My phone number is 904-945-2601. Have a blessed day.